Hey everybody. Um, good afternoon. I'm going to be talking to you guys about continuous deployment at scale. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, is applicable more to medium to large scale projects that are more long term, but uh, there are bits and pieces you can of course take apart for projects of all scale. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Etsy? Oh, most of you guys. So to give you a sense of the scale that we are uh, working with, we have a little less than 2 million sellers, uh, 26.1 million active buyers, and a little under $2.4 billion in GMS, and a little under 1,000 employees, uh, mostly in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my name is Prem Shri, and uh, I'm a senior engineer at Etsy. Before this, I worked as a sen senior engineer at uh, Yahoo. And this is my second time speaking here, so I'm really glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the principles that guide some of the um, ways we think about our continuous deployment. Uh, I'll talk about the, the specific tooling and uh, culture that we have in place in order to, uh, for us to accomplish that, and then we'll end with some Q&A. So um, the, one of the first principles is just ship. Like, it sounds obvious, but uh, it often does not feature in process goals, which often makes it harder to actually do it. Um, we want to enable innovation. We are, our goal is to enable um, building products quickly and efficiently, and we want to be able to do this um, in a manner that's iterable. We are, in the end, we are here to build products. We are not here to write. We are not shipping code. We are shipping products. Um, as people who craft and people who build, our, um, we are motivated by some intrinsic motivators. These include uh, purpose, um, autonomy, and mastery. And we want, when we think of the way we build our continuous deployment tools, we want to, build to, we want to be able to think of these in terms of how they can optimize for these motivators. We want to think of our tools not as hindrances to anything we build. Um, experimentation. So, um, that's basically A-B testing. We want to be able to um, test various uh, ways in which we can optimize our product. So, for example, if, you, if I want to check two variations of a uh, home page and see which one performs better, I should be able to do that. Um, I should also be able to use whatever metrics I choose to mean success for a specific part of the product, uh, whether it's bounce rates going low or uh, conversion increasing, and we should be able to do that easily. We want to iterate quickly. Um, now, we, it's, you're never going to get to a point where you can say a product is done or complete or 100%, uh, and that's completely OK. But we can make measurable improvements uh, to all of our products, and we should be able to do that uh, quickly, and we should be able to iterate on those. Uh, we want to be able to fail fast instead of having stagnant code lying around. Um, baked into the idea is also uh, continuous improvement. So as we um, allow for our tools to help us deploy continuously, we also want the process to facilitate improving our own process. Uh, we also want to optimize for a low mean time to recovery. Um, what that means is an acknowledgment of the fact that failure happens. We, things will fail, systems will fail. Um, and I, instead of preventing failure, what you want to optimize for is how fast can you recover from a failure. So um, before we jump into tooling, let's look at what a typical continuous um, delivery cycle look like. So a developer or designer commits some code um, that triggers a build, triggers some tests, uh, you do some user testing, and then you're uh, ready to release. And of course, at each of these steps, there is a feedback cycle. So if uh, any part of the cycle is broken, you can't move forward, right? So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the tooling we have in place for each of these various steps. So one of the things we do um, at Etsy is we do frequent check-ins, and we check in directly to master. And um, it's, I think I'll, when I say this to people, people often are surprised. Um, we use GitHub, and GitHub is really good at branching. but. Uh, branching in code also means it makes it incredibly hard often to actually debug when there's a problem in production. And so checking into master frequently works really well for us. And we do this by uh, using branching in code. 
And we do that using something known as uh, feature flag. So the uh, Etsy's open source library for features on GitHub. Uh, it's basically very simple. Um, a feature flag is a bunch of configuration that tells whether a feature is on or off. In this case, we have a feature, my feature, that's turned on. A feature can be off. Um, a feature can also be ramped up slowly for a small percentage of users. So in this example, what it's telling me is my feature is enabled for 1% of all users. A feature can also be enabled uh, for a small percentage of users and bucketed by either users or um, through cookie. So here, um, this is bu bucketing by user tells me that every time a feature is enabled for a specific user, that feature is al always enabled for a specific user. So the, uh, it's a difference between when you want a feature enabled for logged in users versus when you want something to show up or not show up irrespective of uh, login status. Um, on the application code, it's a very simple check. You just check for whether a feature is enabled. Um, when you want to check for um, if a feature is enabled for user bucketing, you just pass in the user object. Um, experimentation or A-B testing, we do that also using feature flags. So instead of having code that just checks for whether a feature flag is on or off, um, you can have a multivariant feature where, a, um, in this example, for uh, layout one is enabled for 1% of all users, layout two is enabled for 3%, and layout three is enabled for 3% of all users. So in your code, instead of actually checking for whether a feature is on or off, you will do a switch where you check for which variant of this feature is enabled for that user. Um, one of the concerns that often comes up with feature flags is that they go stale pretty quickly. Um, so if you released a feature and you turned it on, um, the if and switch statements often end up remaining there. So it, it's a tricky problem, but it's not, uh, it, it's not affecting us too badly right now. And one of the things we do now is send automated emails when a feature flag goes stale for after a certain period of time since it's been on for all users. Um, and this all ties into continuous integration. Uh, we always want to keep the build green and we want to be able to release our code at any time. So, um, at the time when a developer is ready to commit code to production, we have a tool called Try. Uh, Try is basically a tool that sends a patch of, um, sends a diff of your working copy to whatever's on master and patches that and runs tests against it. And Try is also available on GitHub. So the advantage of using Try before actually um, going through committing code is that you can be sh uh, sure that whatever you are working on will not um, break the build. So this is, this is a, uh, like a housekeeping task. You do it so that you, you're not affecting other people who are um, on the queue. Um, we, for, um, for actually deploying, we have a tool that's built in called Deployinator, uh, also available on GitHub. Um, this is how it looks like. We have, a, we have an instance of Deployinator running for each of our different stacks, so we have our web stack, which is primarily written in PHP. We also have a bunch of services written in Go, so we have different stacks for each of those. Um, so once you develop, oh, sorry, once you deploy, there's some tests that run. Once the tests look green, you do some manual tests, and then you're ready to release. And like I said before, um, it's just push button deploy. There's a couple of buttons there. The green button is all you would click when you want to deploy. Um, there is, of course, a step before production called, we call it princess. It's a bunch of uh, boxes from production that's just de-pooled. So you basically get almost the exact environment that you would get on production before you actually turn it, off all, t turn it on for all users on production. And so it makes it very easy to push. Anybody can push. Um, anyone who starts at Etsy pushes something the first day they start. It may be very simple, but it helps you get into that mindset of being comfortable to push. Um, I think it's important to understand that you still need to be anxious when you're pushing code to production. Um, you, are, you need to be ready to test. You need to realize that what you are about to push is affecting a lot of users. But you don't need to be 
um, afraid because there are, we have all these tools in place that allows you to push comfortably. Um, typically, in, in a lot of organizations, the relationship between dev and ops is the one where developers hand off code to ops and then ops goes off and um, pushes this code. And there, is, there isn't a communication where um, people feel comfortable with each other. There is, it's more adversarial. But when you have a setup like this, it's, more, it's easy to work with each other. Uh, we, also have, uh, we also allow for this idea of dark changes. Dark changes are any changes um, that you have extremely high amount of confidence in that won't be, break production. Um, typical examples might include like simple template changes, um, some CSS tweaks, tweaks uh, or unreferenced code. Unreferenced code is code, for example, that's say with it behind a feature flag, but it's turned off. So while you're working on your feature, and it's flagged off, you can keep working on it and push it without actually going through the whole cycle of pushing code. Um, and by convention, we just mark it as dark. And so someone who's pushing that code actually knows not to worry about it. Um, along with uh, the typical push cycles for actually deploying code to production, whether it's our web stack or um, services, we have uh, config pushes. So if a feature was enabled for 1% of all users and you want to push it to 50% of all users, you don't need to go through the whole web production uh, push cycle in order to push that. We, so we allow for a different, um, different deployinator that just makes, allows you to change uh, configuration. So we talked about how uh, we use all these tools, but how do we actually coordinate all of this? Um, we do this using a push train, and we do this using very old school coordination of people using IRC. Uh, so what you see there at the topic is the push train. What you see on the push train is there are, um, there's two trains. The first train has five people, and the second train has one people, one person. So every, anytime I'm ready to push my code, I go to this channel. It's called the push channel, and I join. Once I join, I get, um, in the, I get in line in the queue with whoever was leading the train. Um, every time, after every cycle, say we push to princess or production, the pre-prod or prod, uh, if my changes look good to me, I say dot good, which tells the person who's leading the train that things are good and they can proceed to the next step. You can say it in multiple languages. Um, if at this point someone else joins the queue and there is already a train in place, they will get their own, own train that they become the lead for. Uh, so we do this using uh, we, a bot called Pushbot. Uh, the topic grammar for Pushbot is in Antler and available on GitHub too. Uh, so once you are done deploying, it's time for you to know whether everything's looking okay. Um, it's time for you to gain confidence in whatever you built. And we do that using a bunch of tools. Uh, one of them is SuperGrep. SuperGrep is basically an aggregation of all the logs that you have um, that are relevant to this particular stack aggregated together. So it makes it very easy um, when, if any push that you were involved in suddenly caused a spate of errors of a specific kind. Supergrep can get noisy because it's an aggregate of logs from all, all the different boxes in your stack, but we also have a tool called Supertop, which is like top, and will, which will extract out the most common or popular errors that are, um, that are popping up on all your different boxes. Of course, we have uh, dashboards. Um, there are a lot of systems um, so, uh, Etsy-wide dashboards that tell us about um, the various errors that we have on um, different pages. But then, for example, if any of your push uh, causes cost an increase in 404, so you will be able to tell relatively quickly. The uh, horizontal, the vertical lines there that you see there are lines that indicate when you actually when there was actually a push that went happened, and the different colors indicate the different stacks. Um, for the pushes, so one may be a deploy a web stack, one may be a search stack, 
And there are application-specific dashboards. So each team, whenever they're building products, they always uh, instrument dashboards for the specific part of the pr product they're building on. So um, it's easy to tell when any of the pushes have, are affecting their own systems. We we'll do this using StatsD and Graphite. Um, so to summarize, uh, every time uh, someone is ready to push to production, we use, um, they would, before they commit code to, the, um, to GitHub, we run a bunch of Git hooks, of course, and they're all, developers are expected to run try to make sure they're not going to block the push queue. Um, and then they log on to, they go on to IRC, the push channel, and then they join the queue in order to push. They use DeployNator. Whoever's heading the queue pushes on behalf of everyone on that train. Um, once you're on DeployNator, you do some user testing, make sure things look okay, the things that you need to test manually. Um, after which you look at uh, SuperGrep and dashboards to make sure things are still looking stable and then you're ready to leave the queue and you're done deploying. Does anyone know what this is? It, it's an, yeah, it's an RG45, it's an ethernet cable. Um, how many ways can you plug this in? There's only one, how many ways do you think you can plug an, a USB cable in? One, but it's very confusing. <laughs> Um, so uh, when we think of um, the tools we're trying to build in order to uh, allow for continuous deployment, we like to think of the metaphor of pokayoke, which is Japanese for mistake proofing. So you want to always make your tool such that it doesn't take a lot of mental overhead to understand what step you're in or what you need to do in order to get your code out to production. And I think it's a very helpful metaphor to think of. So um, we talked a lot about the technology, but I think you can't have an environment where you can push so easily, quickly, without having the culture to go along with it. And um, there, are, there are some basic um, ideas that you can f foster or encourage in your organization that can help. Um, one of them being you, you're, you're always wanting to assume best intentions. No one is intentionally trying to ever break production or break the code. And so if you go into the rooms already assuming that you want to blame someone for something that went wrong, you're doing it wrong because they probably didn't choose to break it on purpose. Um, so you also want to cultivate empathy. You want to understand where this other person came from when in case things go wrong. And you want to be open. You want to be open to critique. You want to be open to uh, making your systems better. And failure is an option. I think a lot of people like to say and think failure is not an option, but that's not a reality. I think systems always fail. But however hard you try, failures happen. Humans fail. Um, and so we, we, we must acknowledge that failure is an option, but it's not something we want. We, we really don't want to fail but we can acknowledge that we still will fail. And I think the great thing about failure is failure is also an opportunity because it's the one chance we can use to make our systems even more stronger. We can make our systems resilient. And so we do that using uh, postmortems. And we do these postmortems going in um, blameless. So the idea of a postmortem is not to find out during an outage why an outage uh, happened because of person X or person Y, but it's to understand all the various parameters or um, variables involved in what led to that particular outage. I think um, root cause analysis is pretty common in technology, but root cause analysis by definition assumes there's a root cause to things. Often there isn't one single root cause to a failure, and uh, Postmodern can help us understand um, the system in its more complex sense and give us a better understanding of the various levers we can pull in order to make the system more resilient, whether it's through technology or process or humans. 
Um, and postmodernism often, of course, lead to remediation, where we may file a bunch of tickets and figure out like whether do we need to make um, changes in our process? Do we need to make changes in our tooling? Uh, we also uh, have a tool called Marg, where we just document the various failures we had. So it's, it's a pretty cool tool, because you can often learn things from looking at other failures, and it's very extensively documented in uh, terms of exactly the v various uh, conversations that happened, so the steps that were taken in order to find out uh, what happened, and the steps that were, um, or the remediation tickets that were assigned in order to make it more resilient and stronger. Um, this is a three-armed sweater. We used to give, give out a three-armed sweater award to the most uh, spectacular failure of the year. <laughs> but, so, it, it's funny, but I think it's important to realize, like, this, the award is not given for failure itself. The award is given for um, for a failure that led us to make our systems even more stronger. So I think there's a difference between celebrating failure but versus acknowledging failure in order to make things better. And there's a subtle difference there. We don't, we're not trying to glorify or celebrate failure for failure's sake. Um, we have a tool called Mixer within Etsy. Um, it's available on GitHub, I think. Um, so Mixer is this tool that sends out an email uh, once every two weeks if for people who opted in um, that randomly allows you to pair with another person within the organization and go for coffee or um, a remote phone call or something like that. The advantage of doing something like this is that uh, different parts of the organization get to interact. Um, I may not always know what it is like to be in customer support. I may not know, not know what it is like for a seller or a buyer to ask questions to, um, to customer care. If I'm able to connect with this person, I can empathize with this person's job um, better than I would have if I didn't get that opportunity. Um, in the same vein, for you know, a product person to interact with a designer or um, looking at the other way, a support person to interact with an engineer to know what it's like to be in my shoes. It creates an environment where no one's anonymous and everyone's actually a person. It creates a better working environment for everyone. Um, to summarize, um, we have a bunch of culture and tooling in place that allows us to deploy um, fairly often. We most often succeed. Sometimes we fail. When we fail, we conduct postmortems, which lead to uh, remediation items. Um, and these remediation items feed into uh, our existing pipeline that makes our system stronger. In addition to um, this, there's also, you also need external stimulus. Like, we can't have the same cycle go on without having um, anything come in from outside. And that's where learning from people outside, like through conferences or meetups, um, really help. Um, so n we deploy fairly often now. Um, the various colors you see are the various um, deploy stacks we have. We, we deploy around 30 times a day at least, um, and 30 plus config pushes a day, so over 60 pushes every single day. And that's it. Uh, there's a lot of information on the various tools and the processes on the Kodas Craft blog. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you, Premshi. Is there anyone that has any questions? Yeah? So in your continuous deployment, if you have a failure, do you patch quickly or roll back? We roll back. Anyone else? No? I'll be around if you guys have questions. Thanks so much. Yep. So before I release you guys for lunch, um, I have a few announcements.